Hello, we are Memphis Community University. Today we are practicing some AP Calculus free response questions, and the topic is graph free response questions, which again are my favorite free response questions because you don't have to do much math. You're really just looking at a picture. So if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with our channel, what we do is we go from difficulty one through 10 for each free response topic, slowly progressing in terms of difficulty, but also in terms of our improvement. And for graph free response questions, there's two main types. There's one where all the questions are about f and the graph is of f prime. Uh, that is going. That was in our difficulty one and three video, and I believe that will also be in difficulty five, the next one after this. So check that out if you uh, continue, if you feel like it will be useful. But there's another scenario where, like in this example, where there's a function called g of x and g of x is written and expressed as an integral already. So, uh, and then the function will be, of uh, the graph will be f. So it's sort of the same thing. Uh, that's why we have it in the same topic, but it's just different variants. Uh, and they're sort of alternating back uh, year by year. Which one is it? Is it a g integral one or is it an f, f prime one? Uh, so you do want to get familiar with them, but they do use the same shapes of curves rule. So this was going to be similar to our difficulty number two video, just a little bit of a wackier variant. So we are going to be using these shapes of curves rules. Hopefully you can see them, uh, like g increasing, g decreasing, g concave up or down, uh, g local min or local max, g inflection point, where in every single one of these, our justification is going to have g prime equals f does something. So g is doing something because g prime of equals f is doing something. Keep in mind, uh, the most confusing thing, in my opinion, is that the word increasing appears twice. But if you're specific and you say g is increasing because g prime equals f is positive, g is concave up because g prime equals f is increasing. Different things are increasing, so they're different rules. So we'll see these rules uh, throughout this question. Uh, but remember that in this variant, oftentimes before you even look at the graph and also before you start the questions is to write this as well. So uh, basically this variant is the variant where they come up with the integral. So I like to write g prime already. So g prime of x according to the fundamental theorem of calculus well, there is this seven sitting here, which we didn't see in difficulty number two, uh, but the derivative of seven is just zero. So when I take the derivative, this will go away. And then by the fundamental theorem of calculus, when you're taking a derivative of a function that is expressed as an integral, basically the integral and the derivative cancel each other. So you're just left with f of x. And because this is a graph of f of x, this is going to be y values. I also like to take g double prime of x because they might ask me some g double prime values. So g double prime of x, well, that's just going to be f prime of x, which is going to be the slope of this graph, slope of f. Great. So again, g is going to be area. It's actually going to be the area up between any number we want and negative 2, and then we're going to add 7 randomly because they want us to add 7 g prime values equals f, that's y values, and then g double prime equals f prime is slope values. Again, in our shapes of curves questions, um, we're going to be using this as our justification. g prime equals f is positive, g prime equals f is increasing, g prime equals f goes from positive to negative, stuff like that. So keep in mind here, we're not actually going to be doing the fundamental theorem of calculus where you uh, come up with a formula for f of x using an f prime graph. It's f of x equals f of a plus the integral of a to x of f prime of x, or f prime of t, really. And here, because the integral is already provided, you just do this sort of basic information, and you're ready for the questions. Um, so let's do it. So it just says first find g of negative 2, uh, g prime of negative 2, and g double prime of negative 2. So let's write these out. Again, g of negative 2 is going to be the area between negative 2 and negative 2 is 7. g prime of negative 2 is going to be the y value at negative 2. And then g double prime is going to be the slope value at negative 2. So let's write that down. g of negative 2 is equal to 7 plus the integral of negative 2 to negative 2 of f of t dt. Because um, that's this formula right here. So when we plug in negative 2, we only plug it into the top and not into this guy right here. So I don't even need to look at the graph to find this area, actually, because it's the area between negative 2 and negative 2, and that's an integral property. There's no area underneath just a single point, so it's actually just going to be 0. Anytime when you have an integral from one number to itself, negative 2 to negative 2, 0 to 0, 7 to 7, something like that, that integral is just 0. So in this case, we're just going to get 0 plus 7, because we have the 7 on the outside, so just 7. 
uh, g double prime of negative 2? Well, we've already done the work basically already. We have decided that g, double, g prime of negative 2 is the same thing as f of negative 2. And because we have a graph of f, that would just be the y value at negative 2. And they just labeled it. It's 4. So this is going to be 4. Finally, we have g double prime of negative 2, which is f prime of 2. Again, we've labeled it. It's the slope of f at that point. We are given the information that uh, f has a horizontal tangent line. Tangent line means you have a point and a slope where the slope is the, the derivative. So the line is touching the curve only at this point. Uh, the dot's not the perfectly drawn thing, but hopefully you understand what's going on. Horizontal means your slope will be zero, so your derivative will be zero uh, because that's how horizontal lines work. So in this case, uh, when we find a fine F, uh, g double prime of negative 2, that's f prime of negative 2, that's the slope at negative 2, but that's just 0. So notice how qu easy these questions are. We didn't actually have to take any areas, um, but if you know this fact, g is area, g prime is equal to y values, g double prime is equal to slope, then you should be good to go. I do want to mention something that was in difficulty number 2 as opposed to, uh, instead of this one. Let's say we were actually finding g values that were not negative 2. So for example, let's say we were finding g of 2. What you would do is you would find the area. So you would find the area of this thing right here, the area of this thing right here, and then you would subtract off this area because it's negative. So it would be this sum plus this sum uh, minus this part right here in the middle. In, the, in this case, you wouldn't be able to find the areas, which is why it's not asked because it's not common shapes like rectangles or triangles or anything like that, but that's how you would do it. Similarly, remember that if you were trying to find g of uh, g of negative 4, what you would do is you would put in negative 4 into this integral, but you would have to negate the integral because uh, we would put in a smaller number into the top. So when we negate the integral, what we do is we flip it. So instead of doing 7 plus the area between negative 4 and negative 2, we would be doing 7 minus the area from negative 4 to negative 2. And when we do the area, we would be careful with the area. So this is still positive area. This is still a negative area because it's under the curve. So we would have 7 minus, in parentheses, the area from here to here minus the area from here to here. So again, if you want to see more examples of that, I would watch our difficulty number 2, go back to that, where we do those practices. And that's actually more common than this question right here. Uh, usually they ask you to find actual areas. So hopefully you can check that out. But right now we do have shapes of curves questions. So um, we're going to, hopefully you know them by now and you don't have to write out this grid every single time. The most important thing in these free response questions is knowing these rules uh, like the back of your hand. So in this case, uh, usually they don't ask decreasing and concave up in this, uh, different questions because it's too easy. So we're only going to do G is both decreasing and concave up. Before I look at the graph, I like to justify my answer first. So g of x is decreasing. Well, that is when g prime equals f is negative. Again, I'm going to write g prime equals f. So that's when g prime equals f is negative. And g is concave up. When g prime equals f. I think it's better to refer to g prime instead of g double prime because g prime equals f is the graph, and I want to refer to the graph as much as possible. So g prime equals f is increasing. Notice I don't write the words like slope or it or graph or derivative. I just write what exactly it is, g prime equals f. So now I'm ready to look at this graph. Um, so g is decreasing when g prime equals f is negative, so it's one of these three portions. Uh, g is concave up when g prime equals f is increasing, when the slope of f is positive, or when it, the function is literally going up. So it's from negative 4 to negative 2 because it's going up. Also, it is from 0 to 2 because it is going up. Great. So what we want to do is we want to find where that both happens. So we need to be under the graph and be going up. So in this case, it's going to be negative 4 to negative 3 because g prime equals f is negative, it's underneath the curve, and it's, and it's increasing. And over here, g prime equals f is still negative and increasing. So it's negative 4 to negative 3 and 0 to 1. 
very typical shapes and curves questions. They can't really trip you up in any way because uh, once you know the rules, the rules apply to every single graph. Uh, but again, be careful. We have the words increasing and decreasing, but they're in different rules. So they're basically totally different. This is G is decreasing, which implies this rule. This is G is concave up, which implies a rule that has the word increasing, but it's G prime equals F is increasing, not G is increasing. So you're always at answering questions about G with justifications with G prime. So G is increase, de increasing, decreasing when G prime is positive or negative. So when you're going for this question right here, because the graph is G, uh, F, sorry, G prime equals F, you're going to be looking at positive or negative. You're not going to be looking for it decreasing or increasing because the graph is this one. Same thing in this case, G is concave up. You're not going to be looking for concave up on, on the graph because you're looking for what G prime equals F is doing. You're looking where G prime equals F is increasing or decreasing. So let me just answer the main shapes of curves questions because that was uh, just verbally because those won't be asked later on. So again, uh, what we said is G is increasing when G prime equals F is positive. So it's going to be above here. So it looks like it's negative three to negative one, one, two, three. G prime equals F is decreasing. That was part of our answer. Negative four to negative three, negative one to one, three to four, because it's underneath the graph. G is concave up when G prime equals F is increasing. So as we said, it's negative four to negative two, and also one to two, literally going up. G is concave down when G prime equals F is decreasing. Uh, that's from negative two to zero and two to four. Uh, also, there's relevant or max questions. So G has a relative min when G prime equals F goes from negative to positive. So in this case, that would be at negative three and one. G has a rel max or a relative max or a local max where G prime equals F goes from positive to negative, G prime equals F. So that's right here, positive to negative. So at X equals negative one and also three. G prime equals F goes from positive to negative at that point. Finally, the fourth main question is G, uh, inflection points. So inflection points are when G prime equals F goes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Uh, what I joke around as wike versa uh, from our Latin terms, or we say wike versa, uh, vice versa. So it's right here at negative two because G prime equals F goes from increasing to decreasing, which means that G goes from concave up to concave down at that point. Also, there's an inflection point at this point right here because G prime equals F goes from increasing to decreasing. And then finally, there's an inflection point right here. G prime equals F goes from decreasing to increasing. So if you just practice these sort of four questions over and over and over again, even when you have these sort of graphs and just answer, where are the relative min or max? Where's um, the inflection points of the function? Where are um, the intervals which G is both concave up and increasing? and you just answer those questions every time you see these pictures, you'll just have so much practice with them that when you go to the AP exam or a test question, for example, you won't even have to think at all because it's just like natural. Uh, this is definitely the real max. This is definitely the inflection point because you've just done so much practice. So I would encourage as much practice as possible. And if you watch this video series, we hope to provide that for you. But we are gonna be moving on to a little bit of a different question. So in this question, it looks like we're doing equation of the tangent line, uh, a little bit trickier. Hopefully I chose good enough numbers where it will actually work. We will see, but it looks like we have this new function h of x. So we'll write this down. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the equation of the tangent line of h of x. I mentioned this before, but tangent lines shouldn't be too much of a trouble. They appear quite often on any calculus assessment. Basically a tangent line is a line. So it's a point and a slope. In order to find the equation, all you need is a point and a slope. But the word tangent means the slope will be the derivative, so that's how we're going to find the slope. So let's first find the uh, point, I believe. So it's going to be, notice that this is of h and not g or f, but g and f are part of h. So let's do this. Uh, we need to first find h of negative 2. So we're just going to plug in negative 2 into all these x's times f of negative two squared uh, plus negative two. So probably didn't need this many steps, but it's gonna be g of negative two times negative two squared is four, four minus two is two. So it's gonna be f of two. 
Uh, we do need to find these though. Uh, G of negative two we found in the previous question, so just be wary. You don't have to do it again. Uh, remember that we pointed negative two, but there was no area underneath it, so it was just seven. So that's just seven. And then finally, f of two uh, is from this table because this is f, so it's just the y value at two, so it's three. So this is 21. So our point is going to be uh, negative two comma 21. So sometimes they just throw in these random questions that require derivatives and shapes of curves um, and, and these sort of graph for response questions because uh, you don't really, once you've taken the derivative, you'll be just using the graph and the givens and stuff like that. And the hardest part about this question is the derivative here. Keep in mind that it's a product rule question because we have g and uh, f of x squared plus x. And then when we take the derivative of f of x squared plus x, we will need the chain rule as well because there's an inside function, x squared plus x, as opposed to just having an x. So when I take this derivative, it's going to be g prime of x times f of x squared plus x. So that's the first half of my product rule. I took the derivative of the first thing, kept the second thing the same. Then I'm going to add, so hopefully you can tell that this is just going to go like this, not very organized. Probably should have made this box smaller. But we're going to keep this function the same now because we took the derivative of the of that function in the first half of the product rule, so just g of x. And then this is where the chain rule comes in. So it's going to be the derivative of f of x squared plus x. Uh, so that's going to be f prime of x squared plus x and f prime of x squared plus x we do need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function uh, because of the chain rule so it's going to be 2x plus 1 and usually my students remember the chain rule but what they'll miss is that they won't be careful with parentheses so when they start plugging in stuff they'll only have the 2x multiply the f prime but they also need the plus 1 so just anytime you have Anytime you need parentheses, just use parentheses. You're probably not going to miss it if you add more parentheses. But again, the entire inside function is 2x plus 1, so it needs to multiply everything. Now, all we have to do is plug in our point, negative 2. So we get h prime of negative 2 equals g prime of negative 2. Remember that when we plug in negative 2 into x squared plus x, we got 2. So it'll be times f of 2 plus g of negative 2 times uh, f prime of negative 2 times, and when we plug in negative 2 here, you'll get negative 4 plus 1, which I believe is negative 3. So now uh, we're just going to hope that we are, have already found all of these numbers. So the g values we have in the first part, g of negative 2 is 7, g prime of negative 2 is 4, because it was the y value at this point, 4. So... Uh, we can replace those. 5, 4. I don't know why I said 5. Uh, g of negative 2 was um, 7. Oh, keep in mind when you plug in negative 2 here, you'll get plus 2 as well. Because when you plug in negative 2, it'll be negative 2 squared plus 2. So I don't know why I wrote negative 2 there. Uh, this is still negative 3. So we just need two more values, f of 2 and f of negative 2. Well, f of 2 is going to be the y value again, so it's 3. So that's just 3. And then f prime of 2, uh, not the best, most exciting thing, but f prime of 2 is going to be 0, uh, similar to how um, f prime of negative 2 is 0. f prime of 2 is 0 because uh, there's a horizontal tangent line. So the slope of the function at 2 is equal to 0 because, um, yeah, there's no slope. Or not, not that there's no slope, but the slope is 0. There's a horizontal tangent line. So the derivative at this point is zero. So that's why we get zero here. So really, if you didn't make that, uh, if you did make the parentheses mistake here, it wouldn't matter because we have zero, but just be careful with those parentheses in the chain rule, even as you're doing product rule. So in this case, all of this is zero, this is 12. So we are ready for the answer because this is my slope. So it looks like we're gonna use point slope form. So I'm gonna write this in this box here. So it's gonna be y minus the y coordinate equals the slope, 12, and then x minus the x-coordinate, that's going to be x plus 2, because it's minus minus 2, and we are done. <coughs> so that's how I do all my equation of the tangent line questions. I find the point first by plugging in the x-coordinate, unless the point is already given. Then I take the derivative to find the slope, but when I take the derivative, I'm cautious when I need to do product rule, for example, when I need to do chain rule, 
be careful with parentheses, things like that. Then when we plugged in negative two into both the point and to the slope, we used our previous knowledge. So perhaps in a harder variant, uh, this would be the very first question. So you would have to plug in negative two into this to find g of negative two, or you would need to take the derivative. So you would plug in negative two into this to find the y values uh, if we hadn't already done that. F and F prime values aren't too bad. F values are just going to be anything. The y values of this graph, F prime values are going to be the slope of those graphs. So that's how you do uh, equation of the tangent lines. You'll probably do it uh, probably two to three times on the AP exam. So finally, uh, why we're, why this question is harder than difficulty number two, we randomly threw in a Riemann sum into the last part of this free response question. So it's going to be one of the harder Riemann sums, which are trapezoidal. Remember that there are four types of Riemann sums, left, right, midpoint, and trapezoidal. Uh, there's stuff beyond the AP level that are in like college level, like Simpson's rule, but that is not covered on either the AP or AB or the BC exam as of 2020. So we're not going to think about it. Uh, usually Riemann sums don't appear in this uh, free response question. Usually they appear in the tabular free response questions or the table free response questions. Uh, so if you want to practice a lot of Riemann sums, all four types, for example, uh, you can check out that video series where we go from difficulty number one through 10, like we do in this case, difficulty four of 10, where we do it just for table free response questions. So we wrote practice one for that. But here we do have to do a Riemann sum. Um, so uh, first, keep in mind, it's always the difference in the x's. So whatever the shape is, either a rectangle or a trapezoid, it's always the difference in the x's times y values. So the base is always going to be right here. So in this case, it's actually easier because we have a picture. But uh, so we have the intervals are going to be four intervals of length two. So it looks like it's going to be from here to here. So negative two to zero, negative four to negative two. So we'll, we'll mark these out with bigger tick marks, I guess. And then uh, 0 to 2 and 2 to 4. So these are our four, the bases of our four trapezoids, if you want to think about that. And then again, uh, for Riemann sums, you always just choose different y values. So no matter if you're doing left, right, trap, or mid, these would be our bases if these were the givens. And then for right, I would make this rectangle as tall as this number. For left, I would make it as low as this number because I'm doing the left value. For midpoint, I would make it whatever the y value of this one is, so it'd be right here-ish. But for trapezoid, well, what you do is you do the average of these two y values. So I'm not even going to draw the trapezoids out because I don't feel like they're necessary. I'm going to just start finding the Riemann sum. So again, uh, it's going to be 2 times something plus 2 times something plus 2 times something plus 2 times something because it's always the difference in the x's. So 2 times something. This is 2 with... Two. this is with two this is with two and then it's always the difference in the x's and then it's always times different y's so for example uh hopefully you can see the picture as we are doing this uh we need this the magic of technology so if you were choosing right you would choose four because it's the right end point if you were choosing left you would choose negative four as the thing multiplying by two because that'd be the height in this case when you do trapezoidal you just do the average of these two numbers so, uh, not not four, uh, negative four, whatever the y value here is, negative one. So it's going to be negative one plus four divided by two. Again, if you're choosing left, you would choose the y value here. If you're choosing uh, right, you would choose the y value of the right endpoint. For trapezoid, you do the average of these two. But this number never changes. It's always the difference in the x's times different y's. So in this case, it's again, it's the difference of these x's times the average of this y value and this y value. So it's going to be... Uh, 4 minus 1 over 2, or if you want 4 plus negative 1 over 2, because the average of two numbers is you sum the two numbers and divide by 2, then it's going to be the sum we're going to multiply by the average of these two y values. So it's going to be negative 1 plus 3 divided by 2. And then finally, it's going to be the average of these two y values, 3 plus negative 1 over 2. We don't have a calculator, but it shouldn't be too bad because all these twos cancel basically. So what we're going to get is we are going to get um, 3, I believe, because 2, 2, cancel. Negative 1 plus 4 is 3. Here we get another 3. Uh, here we get 2 because these 2s cancel, and negative 1 plus 3 is 2. And then finally, we get our last 2. It's the same computation. We're going to add this up. We get 10. So uh, this is probably one of the only times that I've seen trapezoidal uh, sums in a graph as opposed to a table. So again, if you want to practice 
uh, Remon Sums, what I would encourage you to do is to check out our table for your response question practices. Also our Remon Sum videos. Hopefully those are already up by the time you watch this so that uh, they can provide provide you practice with Remon Sums. But we're actually done with this graph for your response question. Uh, it was very typical. Let me just go over it real quick as a review. Uh, so we have, we have information presented where g is already an integral. So we immediately say g prime is equal to f, g double prime is equal to f prime. Uh, keep in mind that if there was like 7x, then the derivative would be 7 plus f of x. So it'd be 7 plus the y value. Uh, that's going to be a harder variant. I don't remember exactly what difficulty that is later on in the series, but that does occur. And that makes it a lot harder when you have, instead of just y values, it's x plus the y value. But in this case, it's pretty easy. G is um, going to be areas. G prime is going to be y value. G double prime is going to be the slope of this graph f. So that's how we were able to enter these questions right here. Uh, we didn't have to find areas actually, but uh, when you do find areas, just be careful of what is negative and what is positive. There's usually two negatives that are introduced. One of them is area underneath the function or underneath the x-axis, sorry. That's a negative area. And also be careful if you need to negate the area uh, because you plug in a number that's smaller than the given number. So for example, if we plugged in negative three, we would have to negate the integral and then find area and put a negative in front. Next, we did our common uh, shapes of curves questions that hopefully we're getting better and better and better at. Uh, in this case, we did g is decreasing concave up, which is where g prime is less than zero, g prime equals f is increasing. So we look for the graph where it was negative and uh, increasing. So it's just two intervals. And again, you just want to be really good with shapes of curves questions, rel min and function point, rel max, things like that. Finally, we had two sort of strange questions that don't appear every single time on a graph for a response question. First one was equation of the tang tangent line, which is not too bad. Just like normal, find a point in a slope where slope is derivative. Start plugging in negative two carefully into all of this. Uh, when you take the derivative, just be careful with product rule and chain rule. And then for any g or f value, you do use the givens, either the graph or g, which is based off the graph. Then finally, we had this rare trapezoidal Riemann sum question um, in the graph frick, but it's still the same thing. Always the difference in the x's, which were these numbers right here. Even if you have a table and they're sort of different intervals, it's always the difference in the x's times different y values. Choose the left if you're doing left, choose the right if you're doing right, choose the midpoint y value if you're doing midpoint, and then do the average of left and right if you're doing trapezoidal sum. So again, check those videos out. But for now, uh, we are done. Uh, difficulty number five is sort of another uh, question where f will be given in, in an f prime graph. And in that case, it will be pretty similar to difficulty number three, but there will be some sort of wacky things as you will see. Uh, later on in this series, we'll see a graph free response question that's particle motion. So if that will help you, please check that out. Um, we'll have weird questions where we have harder functions um, and things like that. So we, of course, uh, we, of course, appreciate your support of this channel by watching and giving us likes and su subscriptions. Uh, continue watching. Uh, these graph free response questions are important because they appear every single year. And hopefully by the time you finish this series, difficulty one through 10, you will have seen so many variants that you'll be very confident and you will achieve great things uh, on the graph for your response question on the AP exam. But until then, uh, thanks again for watching and I am signing off and going to eat lunch. Thanks again.